Many times. <laughs> many, many, many times. <laughs> I would literally watch the news during the day and see certain people attacking each other and then see them with their arms around each other or sitting in each other's laps. One person that I, I talk about in the book as well um, is like, uh, my personal criteria is would I be comfortable having my wife in a bathing suit next to this man? And again, that's like, that's a whole lot of sort of... I mean, that's probably his own kink. <laughs> <laughs> that's probably something personal to <laughs> no, no, <laughs> giraffe. But- well, <laughs> I mean, you wouldn't want to put it in an, ap- in an apartment, right? <laughs> oh, wow, low blow. <laughs> Easy shot and too low. Hello and welcome to a very special episode of the Pakistan Experience because uh, for once we scheduled an episode months in advance and this shows you um, foreign <laughs> sazish uh, that this episode was scheduled. Uh, we have a foreign conspiracy with us who has come to Pakistan to expose the elite. Rosita <laughs> Armitraj is here. Uh, she's She has a PhD from ANU, Australian National University and uh, she's an anthropologist, she's a public policy person or should I say expert already? Sure, whatever you like. I'll go <laughs> Governance on. specialist. Uh, she specializes in elite politics, Arab studies, Islam. Uh, so these are some of her research interests. How are you doing? I'm well. Thank you for having me. <laughs> it's a real exciting opportunity to be here with you on the Pakistan experience. So since uh, the Pakistan experience is what is known as an elite podcast <laughs> and one of our research interests is who truly is middle class. That's mm. what we're truly known as so it's good that you're here with us today Mm. who really is middle class Rosita (laughs) well I mean I'm not an expert on the middle class (laughs) that was going to be my original research topic actually I was going to do a study on the aspirations of the Pakistani middle class because that was the group that I knew to begin with but um, I have moved away from that research interest and you met somebody who owned a cigarette company and that was that (laughs) exactly and that was that so yes who's middle class that's um you should read Amara Maksud's work for that. Mm. She's done excellent research on the middle class. So, I mean, uh, w- when we talk about the elite, there is that categorization of uh, just the money, right? For instance, uh, Ozair was like everybody who calls themselves call themselves middle class. Mm. The categorization is 50,000 rupees household income. If, oh. if we just go by that, mm-hmm. nobody, uh, almost nobody... Uh, is middle class who pretends to be middle class online I mean if you have an internet connection if you're going to one of the elite schools mm-hmm. even if you're going to one of these Beacon House city schools you're pretty much part of the elite so mm-hmm. so how, how do you categorize the elite because uh, in your book you're you don't even just talk about the money it's also the connections it's right. also what club you go to it's also right. the prestige it's also the name so so is it just the money factor or is it also all of that yeah so it's it's a lot more and of course like the term elite is used in different ways by so many different people and i know the pakistani media loves to talk mm-hmm. about elite capture that seems to be every second newspaper article is talking about elite capture but when i talk about the elite i'm talking about the top one percent of wealth owners in the country and i have a bottom limit for my research which was uh, those family yes 100 million in revenue a year and that's the baseline and the informants that I worked with estimated that there are 100 to 200 families in Pakistan who fall within this top 1% group but in addition to having wealth which is of course a prerequisite they have um, as you mentioned these vast social networks which are tightly guarded and developed through elite schooling systems, through uh, social practices and tightly guarded social networks, um, through systems of marriage where they're reproduced um, by marriages with uh, other elite families with complementary forms of power. And so uh, being elite is um, you need to have wealth, but I define it as also having um, disproportionate access to power. Uh, resources, you know, power, but political power um, that you're able to exercise in a way that an ordinary citizen can't. The 100 million figure, is that f- when you say family, family income, do you mean household income? For, because let's say somebody owns Sapphire, mm. that person has children, his children's children have children. 
so whoever the grandson is would would he also become part of that would would the grandson also qualify because the grandfather makes has a co- owns a company that makes revenue in excess of 100 million mm. I, i i yes the grandson would belong to that family which mm. falls within the elite but they may not be you know an elite power holder in the same way yeah. i mean it's interesting when you look at the generations um of elites uh, the power does uh, shift and dissipate you know in, in different ways um uh, i initially ended up researching like the children of the elite because that was the easiest group to access and of course they don't have the kind of power that i'm talking about they have some inherited funds from their parents so uh, so uh, let's get into the research itself mm-hmm. you start talking to them and uh, clearly you have a lot more access than maybe a pakistani researcher would because pakistan has this fascination with white people <laughs> i think uh, <laughs> especially our elite who got enriched by the colonizers mm-hmm. are still very sad that white people left us so the moment we <laughs> we see a white person we're like just come into our homes and make us feel like it's 1937 again <laughs> there may be some of that <laughs> i'm sure that's a lot of that <laughs> I'm yeah. sure if you're Pakistani I don't think you'd you'd get the same access. I completely agree. No, I I I wouldn't have. And you're right, there is this colonial legacy yeah. towards the British that I benefit from. I mean there's that's that's uh, a maybe cynical way to look at it but true very true i mean there's also this pakistani hospitality to outsiders which is a part of it you know to you know sort of welcoming in new people but i do agree with you i had access that uh, a pakistani wouldn't have and partly it's because of this sort of maybe colonial hangover but secondly it's also because i'm outside of the class structure that i'm researching and um And the other thing is especially in 2014 there was almost nobody doing any research on Pakistan that wasn't terrorism related and people were delighted to be asked a question that wasn't to do with you know what's happening with terrorism in your country or why is this so dangerous uh, and and of course they were quite happy to to answer a question from a foreign lady which was kind of a flattering question which was how did you become so successful it's a nice question to ask to ask so sure, but i mean the the you're doing your research then the, apparently according to the book they're also inviting you to lunch and they're sitting with you for 4 hours yes i don't think that's happening if you're pakistani no that's honestly. true that's true no i completely agree with you i don't i don't think a pakistani would actually even get the access that i had it because as i talk about these networks are so tightly guarded it it, it wouldn't make sense just to let a regular yeah. middle class person into those worlds and uh it's also i it's surprising that this seemed to open up to you which they wouldn't right because if there was a pakistani person they'd be like where will this news go will mm-hmm. if this comes in the newspapers it might be a problem for me yeah uh, so so in terms of the access uh, a pakistani being there also comes with the weight right like you you've spoken about this anecdote where you take a picture where the elite are drinking and partying and if that comes out mm. people who are performing piety in the public it might be an issue for them right so so giving access to people in those spaces where they're different from their public image is mm. also comes at a huge risk to them which is why they deny it that's right and it is interesting that they had trust um that a foreign researcher would adhere to their research ethics and you broke that trust by printing the book <laughs> no i did not <laughs> so actually most of my research subjects were quite comfortable with the idea of being part of my research and i was introduced to people as as this is rosita she's writing a book about pakistan and about pakistani business people so they knew that they would go in the book and were m- largely very trusting that I would not include any personally identifiable information and I haven't so as as you can see from the book I do tell people's really personal stories and there's a lot of personal detail but their names have been changed and anything else that you know would be clearly identifiable but just another interesting point on that party that you talked about um, that I refer to in the book where they remove the alcohol before the photo is taken and many of those parties including <laughs> you're laughing that's what we did right before we came on the podcast we got a <laughs> removed all the beers well, from the table well it looks table. really tidy and nice so you've done a good job <laughs> So this um, is some clear vodka. Oh right, it's certainly a mug full. <laughs> it's water before people start canceling me. <laughs> I'll show you it's water. <laughs> Or maybe I'm an alcoholic. 
<laughs> so, sorry about that. <laughs> no, that's fine. I was just going to say at that party, there were also a lot of journalists and there often were. And so I think that's an interesting thing as well, that of course, journalists aren't part of the elite, but some journalists are allowed access to those communities. And again, they've developed relationships of trust where the elites present in the room, there were many politicians, know that they aren't going to report on anything that that happens in the conversation. So it's still a useful relationship on both sides because they're sharing, um, well, basically they're forming a relationship. So when the journalist wants an interview, they know who to go to. And when the politician wants someone to discuss a particular policy or issue, they know who to get it out through. Uh, but again, there is this level of trust, which I find quite remarkable. I mean, it's it's also quite shocking that a lot of these journalists who pretend to stand for the working class heroes in Pakistan, oftentimes, uh, anytime they want to get any work done, they have all these numbers in their phone. Mm-hmm. Like if they're going to the license office, they're not standing in line. Right. If I, if you're a journalist, you're not standing in line, right? You'll right. know the person, mm. you'll, you'll have a call, the license will come to you. So the so journalists... Also, not all journalists, of course, yeah. but but some of the elite journalists that everybody would know by name, they enjoy the same perks and privileges that come with these access. Right, right. That's true. I mean, I knew a lot of jour- journalists on both sides, the kind who have that access mm. and then the kind who certainly didn't. Yeah. yeah. I mean, from uh, if I play devil's advocate, uh, if you're reporting on certain things, you need protection by certain people at least, right? You, you can't go after everybody, which yes. is my problem. <laughs> everybody <laughs> abuses me on Twitter because I don't have any group oh. on my back. So, so certain times journalists just attach themselves to a politician right. or a group or uh, the military to ensure that once they go after the other people, so at least there's somebody in their corner. So you need to build your own elite network. So please tell me the names of the 70 people <laughs> and uh, give me their numbers because I need somebody in my corner. Right, right. You need a few. And in fact, you'll need several. That's what elites do is that they create a sort of a broad network of people. So you'll need maybe yeah. 10 or so names. Uh I'm not sure how closely you understand Pakistani politics, but uh, isn't it also true that these politicians from different parties and these journalists from different channels, uh, they'll do a show attacking each other and pretend like uh, supporters of their parties should not even sit with the other. Mm -hmm. And then at night, they'll be in the same room drinking and having a good time. A hundred percent. I saw that many times, (laughs) many, many, many times. (laughs) I would literally watch the news during the day and see certain people attacking each other and then see them with their arms around each other or sitting in each other's laps. Absolutely. I mean, you've seen them a lot closely than I have. I haven't seen the (laughs) video leaks of the lap. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, it's quite a sight. (laughs) Uh, Just before we actually get into the meat of it and what they say and what uh, it means to be an elite in Pakistan, in terms of the research... uh, did you record them on audio or no. did you just take notes? Just take, I just so, took notes. So, I mean, how how do I know that you actually interviewed? What if you sat <laughs> and, at home? And, yes, <laughs> and had a fantasy about all of this. Yeah, well, I mean, that's, that's interesting. You know, university research ethics are meant to provide some kind of verification yeah. of these kind of processes. And one of the things that researchers need to do is keep their um, research notes for seven years. So I have a huge stack of very secret <laughs> um, notes with all of my interviews in them. And that's something that, that universities feel is sufficient to, to justify. Uh, so, I mean, you have to basically take my word for it. If you actually wanted to really investigate whether I'd done it, you could easily ask around and ask a few people, did she meet, you know, what kinds of people was she meeting with during that time she was here? Because obviously many, no one knows exactly who I've met with, mm. But um, many people know the kind of access that I had. So it's generals, it's politicians. Not generals. I didn't. I didn't um, interview anyone in active military service. And early on in my research, one of my closest informants in business told me, and I trust his judgment, told me you need to stay away and keep keep your distance. Um, and so as a result, I did interview some retired generals and brigadiers, but I didn't interview anyone who was active. And that was that was a conscious decision. Uh, so an interesting anecdote is that anybody who talks to you uh, says that the problem is the elite. Yes. And these are people who make $100 million in revenue in a year. Mm. And somehow they think 
they're not the elite because the word elite has become pejorative in Pakistan. Yes, yes that's exactly right. So they don't associate it with the amount of wealth that you hold. They associate it with when you acquired your wealth, uh, the kind of family that you come from, and the kind of lifestyle choices that you engage in. And so uh, in the book, you know, I talk about this established elite that have their origins in either the colonial administration or in the first two decades of Pakistan, and then the new money elite who acquired their wealth later, often in association with like General Zia's um, yeah. military regime or even Musharraf's. And... Uh, they, yeah, they have very different views. Like people who, you know, the established elite would pejoratively call new money mm. were very reluctant to call themselves elite. And, the new kings. And, <laughs> yes, exactly. Yes, <laughs> Raja. Exactly, exactly. And they, they really didn't like the term elite and said, you know, we... You know, we didn't inherit our money in this way. We've we've earned our money. We've um, we've worked hard. We had integrity. We had determination, uh, which was an interesting, an interesting sort of separation from the power and wealth that they held. And of course, they also inherited privilege, but in different ways and perhaps um, over a shorter period. Uh, I mean, I'll give you an anecdote. I was talking to somebody who also think he's a working class person, but is massively elite mm. so he was telling me a story about a family member and they said you know the new administration has made things really tough for us and uh, if if these policies continue then how will businessmen even operate and i started probing i said what's the issue he said that you know previously we used to smuggle the parts into pakistan uh-huh. and then make them and sell them and now it's become so hard and i said wait a minute but do the, the issue was that you can't smuggle <laughs> the parts anymore and they said but you have to do something to do business think about all the jobs that we create once the parts are smuggled in mm-hmm. then we assemble them and sell our products so we're, we're right. creating jobs we're creating business yeah. and uh, people need to realize that so somehow in their mind mm-hmm. smuggling was not an issue exactly the ends justify yes. the means that's right so, so where do you think this this complete um it's it's it goes even beyond being blind to their own privilege mm. but this this these illusions that they've created about who they are where mm. is it coming from well i mean you've got to unpack that question a bit in a way because this you know i talk about it a lot in the book as well this this um interlinking of like morality and and legality or immorality and and illegality is really interesting in pakistan and actually it's not just in pakistan but any state that has a lot of political instability or um authoritarian or abusive governments have this disassociation of you know the law and morality and so acting in breaking laws smuggling there's no problem with that it's not an it's not an immoral act for most people and that's made even more stark you know in, in Pakistan with its its history of uh, you know r- continuous regime change each new regime brings in a new set of policies um, and SROs and and other kinds of tools which elites use against one another to to penalize their rivals or to penalize you know supporters of the previous regime and um, and it's led to people feeling a huge amount of impunity for any kind of illegality that they engage in. And even more interestingly, again, it comes back to this, the, ends justif- the end justifies the means. So that comment that you made is perfect. Like, we employ all these people. That's a positive thing. We, we generate jobs, income for people of Pakistan. So smuggling is useful. It's valuable because it, it creates all this economic growth. Which also is probably not true if you start unpacking that because they're paying lower than the minimum yeah. wage by yeah. doing the daily wage labor standard. Where mm-hmm. People are being hired on, yes. I mean, they're being contracted on daily wages as opposed to uh, having a monthly employment contract mm-hmm. which, which come with its own uh, mm-hmm. regulations and policies. So you're literally giving people less than pennies and then making millions of that and somehow you see that as being good for Pakistan. Right. Well, I think that's true for a number of people. Yes, I think that's that's true for m- quite a few business people. I mean, some it's you know also have this very strong sense of social responsibility. It's just that their sphere of social responsibility is much more tightly defined than we would think. They're not thinking 
you know, let's benefit all of Pakistan. But they are thinking, I have this huge group of dependents. There might be 600 people who work in my factory. I'm responsible for them and their families. Especially, you know, a lot a lot of elites have factories in more rural settings. Um, and whole com- whole communities are dependent upon them. And they, I mean, it's, it's kind of the feudal model. But they see them, and even if they're not feudal lords, but they see themselves as responsible for those people. And they do provide services that the state doesn't. Like if someone gets sick, they will pay for the medical care in many instances. In some instances. I mean, sure. there's been so many Not instances all. where uh, people have been injured in the factory, where people have lost limbs and arms in the factory yeah. Yeah. and have received no medical compensation for that. That's absolutely true. That's absolutely true. I'm just kind of adding a bit of a nuance to I'm that. I'm sure that's what they tell you. I mean, <laughs> I'm sure in their minds, they're like, you know, we, we provide for these... Mm. Maybe they have in some instances. Uh, another irony that I find in the elite of Pakistan is that they keep uh, bragging about how much charity that they do. Mm-hmm. But if you're avoiding tax and then you're not paying people fair wages. Yes. And then you're self-aggrandizing yourself by having a charity organization. Is this really something, a net positive for society? Yes, ab- absolutely. And I think that, again, is a, is a primary tactic, these highly visible acts of philanthropy and it's very common you're donating you'll see people making millions and millions and millions and then they develop a small hospital you know and and they say make have a big opening and they bring all the press and they get lots of media coverage uh like these kind of small developments and they get a lot of mileage out of that and then of course the other thing that elites get a lot of like moral mileage out of is like highly visible acts of religiosity like Mm. doing the hajj and making sure that's televised and filmed i mean one of the richest people in karachi or probably maybe the richest person in karachi is called akil karim daddy Mm. so he has these cows that he imports every single eid Mm -hmm. uh and eid ul azza is when we slaughter the animals Mm -hmm. uh and then the, the, the almost half the city goes. So those cows are there for the entire month. And and the one of the places to be for the city is to go and see his cows. And literally the traffic around the road is blocked because everybody's going to see these imported cows. And it's just... <laughs> It just baffles you sometimes mm. at, at how these in- idiosyncrasies play out in Pakistan. So as an outsider... Things that we see as being normal, like mm-hmm. if somebody has a huge charity organization and they're doing great work in that, we see it as a positive for society. But as an outsider, things that should be public goods, the fact that these elite in their networks uh, have made sure that the public does not get those goods or the government is not strengthened in a way which it's able to provide those public goods, but they give out crumbs from their table and make people feel uh, that that the masses should be uh, indebted to them and feel gratitude for these crumbs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I think that's a really interesting example that that's, that's, I completely agree with you. It's, it's kind of a smoke and mirrors tactic. And yeah, I was looking at a a quote that another researcher um, said, which I thought was really apt and it reminds me of it. It was um, in Pakistan, the people, people are, more concerned with the moral piety of their individual leaders than with issues of like uh, of social equity like the discourse the you know the public discourse and the media discourse is more focused on the individual morality of, of each leader rather than on what they're doing for the country you know in terms of social equity and i thought that was quite um quite apt so as an outsider somebody who probably grew up with these ideas of public goods which mm-hmm. Are, which is not something that you even think twice about, right? Mm. How strange did you find all of this while talking to these people? Uh, I mean, I think what I found strange at first was this mental gymnastics around you know, transforming what they're doing into something which is not only not problematic, but even potentially positive. And, and just the, the kind of the language that goes around to justify certain kinds of behavior, you know, so I quickly learned I could never ask about bribes, like people's backs would just get up right away, but I could ask about gifts and people will talk about gifts very freely. (laughs) Of course I give gifts. I give gifts to the police commissioner. I give gifts to the, you know, to whoever it is in whichever political party. But it's interesting how powerful language is because those kind of terms, you know, and and I've got another instance, um, 
one of my friends was talking about his price setting, um, you know, amongst the other people in his industry. And I, and I said, oh, so you're forming a cartel. And he's what are you sort of spluttered. I, I'm not forming a cartel. Everybody wins. <laughs> but everybody being the producers in his industry, right? And I thought that, again, like that was me slipping up. I had fallen into pejorative language because, of course, cartel is, you know, this very n- negative term. Um, and a lot of elites even refer to other elites as being like mafiosos and meaning that they're particularly corrupt or, you know, that they think they're engaging in more of these practices than everybody else. I can't imagine that these people, when they go to sleep at night, they're telling themselves that they're actually the heroes of Pakistan. I think somewhere mm. they do realize this, which is why the, they, they need to do the smoke and mirrors to convince themselves as much as they're trying to convince others. Mm. So you have an innate sense of a moral core. <laughs> <laughs> so you're saying the Pakistani elite don't <laughs> I'm I'm saying that I think that morality is a, a very nebulous concept and that people can define it in almost any way that they like and I, I don't think that the elites that I was in contact with were having any moral qualms at all Does it get any better with the next generation? I mean we, we assume that these people who've gone to the US, have gone to the UK and have seen a different world or have studied in universities where they're taught certain things in a certain way or learn about history. When they come back, mm. do they just slide right back into the morality that exists within their family and within their structures or mm. does, do, do they push back? Well, I mean, I, th- I think that the next generation who are educated overseas certainly bring back a lot of professional skills with them and they come back with you know, a lot of ideas about how to do business or politics well. um, And a lot of them do come back with a lot of idealism. But the mode of operating here is so powerful that it is very difficult to succeed if you aren't following the rules of the game. And so if everybody else that you're competing with uh, are getting exemptions from, I mean, they're, they're they're underpaying their taxes or they're avoiding taxes or they're, you know, they're penalising their competitors through SROs. And if you're not doing any of that, you're no longer competitive, right? So your business will suffer and your ability to succeed in politics will be impeded. That's the problem. So even with the next generation, I think they do come back with a lot of idealism and ideas about how they're going to change things. But you quickly realize some some things are hard to avoid if you're going to compete with other people who are p- using these tactics. I know somebody who is part of the same, one of the elitist mm. families, one of the most elite families, and then they left and then started doing something privately. And they're like, when I was in that environment, I also, reala- I also thought that this was the only way to do business. Mm-hmm. And now when I... Mm-hmm do my own thing, I realize that no, you can actually play by the rules and you mm-hmm. can actually uh, do something good mm-hmm. and still make money without having to resort to all those tactics. Yeah, yeah. And I, I, I mean, I think that's true. And in, I mean, in Karachi, even more than other places, there are more people like that. But, I mean, who play by the rules, you know, in their own terms. But one thing that I found with everybody that I talk to is that everyone is underpaying their tax. I mean, that yep. that sounds, you know, like a minor indiscretion, but that's a major, that has a major impact on society and on inequality, right? If no one's paying their tax properly, the state wouldn't even have a hope of providing public services that people need in order to be able to move up in society, in order to be able to get good jobs or to be able to monitor state performance or to request a new way of government operating, Right. I mean, it's even more revolting, right? Because they'll pay a politician to maybe get uh, almost free land Mm -hmm. and then get a subsidy on the work that they're doing and Mm -hmm. then maybe get subsidized gas Mm -hmm. and then create a product and then sell it and make profits and then not pay tax on that. Right, right. And what's interesting is that you can use things like SROs to make those processes legal. Yep. Right. And so it's not about illegality. And then it's it's difficult to say, is that immoral? You know, if, if it's legal... And I found a way to do it. But if you've sent a gift to somebody to get it done. Yeah. 
uh, I think you're, you're pretty much conscious of the morality well, of no, the well, action. No, that's true. But the problem is, like, it's not as transactional as simply transactional as that. It's not like I give you a gift and then you have to give me something immediately. I might invite you for dinner and put on a huge feast. You know, like a year ago, invite everybody that you know. Oh, that maybe maybe you come and you say, "I've got this huge political. I've got this huge legal problem. Can you help me with it?" And then it's not until like a year and a half later, or even longer. that i come back and say hey, i'm having this issue can you please help me with this so that's that's kind of friendship right like <laughs> that's what friends do for each other and so that's what's interesting again about this class is that the lines between friendship and professional networks and you you know sort of utilitarian needs are, are all blended so it, it it isn't easy to say that was a bribe or it's a favor and a favor's not okay Is no one allowed no. to give each other favors? <laughs> I mean, if if the government is handing out licenses for certain products, let's say like sugar, mm. and they're only handing them out to their friends, and then you sure, if you, uh, yes, of course, and some things are very clear cut. Yeah, things like that. If you're only handing out licenses to a few people, but a lot of these kind of maneuvers are more subtle. I mean, it's also. Uh, It's almost some sometimes these businessmen hold to ransom the state. Mm. We talk about the chief of army staff being the strongest person or the most powerful person in Pakistan. Mm. But uh, a couple of years back, these the, some of the richest businessmen, including Mansha, including Akil Karim Daddy, uh, held a press conference and then General Bajwa had to go and talk to them. Right. So so they managed to hold to ransom mm. uh, the pow- most powerful, and they got concessions off of that. Exactly. So the elite also hold a lot of power. For instance, in this automobiles, yes. they threatened to shut down operations based mm-hmm. on certain taxes. But when you actually break it all down, they're making a lot of money. Mm-hmm. Of course, they're moving around the numbers a little to make it seem like they're making a loss. But they're making a lot of money, and essentially what they're doing is they're importing parts and assembling them. They, they in all these years of operating. They've also not managed to make a car in Pakistan, mm-hmm. so you're not really adding much to the Pakistani economy. Right. But your ad, but our economy is so much on the brink that just by threatening to shut down, you can still hold the government to ransom over that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I completely agree. It's quite amazing the amount of power that they have. So I mean, we we talk about the military, we talk about. the government we talk about the politicians and bureaucrats but just the financial elite mm. i don't think we ever mention them but they the equally as powerful if not more mm. financial elite you mean business people yes. yeah absolutely and that i mean that's where this research started it, i was looking at the business elite and i was trying to focus just on business families but of course as i looked at their family trees i realized that they were the political elite and they were also the military elite Yeah, at the senior most level, or if they're not, then they're married to somebody. Well, that's what I mean. Yeah. That's exactly what I mean. Not the individual. Like, there's still a businessman, and that's his job. But his uncle or his brother is a politician, you know. And then his other uncle's a politician to a in a different political party. And then the other one is a retired general. Like, this was almost unanimous across these families. So they say, "Oh, I'm a business family. I'm apolitical." But that's not what their family tree tells you. Like, are you really? Because when you look at each member of the family, and I and I literally drew them, I mapped them all out. I, I wanted to publish that, but of course, even with changed names, it's too. <laughs> 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 even if I get rid of all the names, people would be able to draw those links. So I could. <laughs> uh, not to get all conspiracy theorist about this, mm. but like you know these these conversations about the Rothschilds in the USA mm. and the Illuminati, mm. and everybody just being connected somehow. But in Pakistan. Uh, the nebulous elite that you're talking about are a lot more incestuous, like that. Right. That that you can almost within two or three degrees of separation uh, find every single elite being connected to each other in yes. one way or the other. Yes, exactly. In fact, one of the things I wanted to do but didn't have sophisticated enough software was to map like all of the families that I knew in in the relationships to each other and who they knew socially, because I would. You know, just in this sort of seventy people, well, seventy individuals, and then their extended families that I was looking at—you, ninety. There were the connections were just vast, and even between cities, you know, even between Lahore and Karachi and Islamabad. Of course, it's tighter in each city, but enormous networks, which I mean, enormous like kinship networks, but then also these social forums, incredibly powerful. 
I mean, you do write about this fact that the the new money mm-hmm. that people majoritarily look at, one way for them to get the privilege that they don't get, uh, mm-hmm. despite having the money, is by marrying people who have an old name and who have that mm-hmm. old prestige. So access to things like clubs, uh, like let's say Synth Club in Karachi. Yes. Uh, it doesn't matter what money you have. Right. It doesn't matter that you're rich. You have to be a part of a certain family or have yeah. a certain lineage to get into Synth Club. Mm-hmm. So. despite having all the money in the world people who can't get into synth club have a chip on their shoulders so one of the way is for them to blend in blend in and get the prestige of the old family this is by marrying off their childs or their children into this mm-hmm. family right yeah abs- absolutely and again but th- even then that's it's hard to do so i did see a lot of instances of that but where it works best is this sort of old fashioned process which people have been using for generations is a lower class so like a, you know not as not as upper class not as elite as um as the established elite family if they have daughters particularly very pretty daughters <laughs> <laughs> that's the really that, that's the most successful way to do it and people would even talk about their own family trees and be like my grandfather my you know that like my grandma and grandfather had eight daughters and they were reputedly extremely beautiful so you know they married one to a feudal lord they married one to a rising star in the military they married one to the political party and i mean that's again you know women in this class have much less power than men but you know one of the things they can trade is you know if they if they have this reputation for being very beautiful that is an amazingly quick and powerful way to propel their family into you know this upper echelon of of elite power holders and i saw that a number of times that's very interesting so you know we we criticize this uh and the brand has just done this rebranding as well there should be a brand called fair and lovely which has mm. now become glow and lovely mm. uh so this aspirational aspect of having fair skin uh which obviously is problematic in its own ways mm. uh but uh, i i guess they know who they're advertising to because this this idea is this elite men are looking for these fair skin girls mm. so if if you're not a uh, member of that class one way to get into it is to become fair and look beautiful right <laughs> well i mean it might be a bit too simple <laughs> but there is something there is something in that and i thought it was interesting that even when people talk about their own families they identify that and they were able to to see ah yeah my family went from the professional classes you know like respectable professional roles as as lawyers or um w- whatever kind of professional role but then yeah being able to jump significantly up through you know through daughters was one of the strategies it was quite interesting but within your own generation i would say it's probably impossible right so even if you're a well paid lawyer mm. making a money that's equivalent to that mm. you don't necessarily become a part of that class just by what you are yeah it'd be almost impossible yeah I mean t- to get into that elite class uh no it'd be almost impossible. So yeah. how do how do they guard it? Well, um I mean through so many ways. <laughs> I mean I th- I think marriage again just while we're on a marriage is one of the most powerful ways of doing it. There's this whole community of people, aunties and uncles weighing in on who people are allowed to marry and making sure that they're the right kind of person. and you know, one of the people that i i look at you know l- lamented that he had he had chosen a love marriage and that had been like the bane of his existence in in you know the the 20 years following because his wife although she was elite by almost every standard was not as wealthy as him and it had continued to cause problems in their marriage as um as she wasn't able to her discretionary income was lower than her sister-in-law's Right and so he said I should have listened to my parents. I should have married someone exactly in my social class with the exact same amount of power and privilege. So I thought that was interesting um that there is this sort of self-policing and 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 most people do conform to these marital requirements. Uh, and uh, quite a lot of people would talk about you know like you can date whoever you want in the elite class that's completely fine but when it comes to marriage you have to follow who your parents want you to marry and who the community wants you to marry but other forums which you know are extremely powerful are like schooling networks like karachi grammar school yeah. and and the the lifelong network that that provides um you know as you 
head through every stage of your life. Having this group of people who are spread out through the business, political, military communities that you can call on when you have a challenge, that that's incredibly powerful. And then like I think the most striking one is the social clubs that you mentioned, like the Sin Club or the Boat Club. And that is the most... Um, sort of clearly articulated that I had um, of, of how class is protected. They literally have a, like a membership committee who all interview you know, people who are you can't even you can't even just apply. You can apply, but you have to be nominated by two people who are already members. Mm-hmm. And then there's this like these lengthy processes of, you know, like having dinner with the committee where they're just watching you. Like how are you eating? How are you talking? What is your wife doing? You know, <laughs> are you dressed appropriately? And then these one-on-one interviews. But the whole, I mean, each of the people that I spoke to on the committees would define what it takes, to, how they define the right kind of person differently. So there was no set criteria, except you do have to be able to pay the fee. The only the criteria is just whatever the people on the board think it should be. Like one person that I, I talk about in the book as well. Um, it's like uh, my personal criteria is would I be comfortable having my wife in a bathing suit next to this man? And again, that's like that's a whole lot of sort of. I mean, that's probably his own kink. <laughs> <laughs> that's probably something <laughs> personal. To <laughs> no, no, but interesting. What what I think he meant by that was that I I only want someone here who has a lot of exposure to the West, right? Mm. Because people here aren't used to just seeing women walking around in bathing suits, and it would be. Um, you know, it would probably cause lots of people to stare. So he thought that the only people who should be admitted by his criteria were those who had spent a lot of time in Western countries where there is not this taboo around women in swimsuits, right? I mean, it was weird that you anonymized him into Mr. Cuckold. I mean, that that was a strange name. <laughs> 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 nice. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, uh, <laughs> it was but one example. <laughs> it was but one. <laughs> I I get what you're talking about because I'm a member of Karachi Jim Khana and I had to go through the membership process uh-huh. and it's 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 similar in many ways. Yeah. I mean it's it's not as elite as mm-hmm. the Sin Club and I'm doing the same thing as your interviews. <laughs> See, I'm elite, but I'm not Sindh Club elite. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like Jim Khanna elite. But see, isn't that interesting? Like that you, like, you know what kind of elite you I, are. I know, I know my, <laughs> I know my ceiling. <laughs> so, I mean, they, they don't have these uh, swimming pool type issues. Do mm. uh, they? I've never been to the mm, swimming pool. Well, there you go. I can't swim. So, right. that's my issue over there. Mm. But they, they, you go through a similar process where mm. uh, you have to be nominated and then the people in the committee, they all talk to you uh, and they all have different questions. They're not mm. like, what do you do? Uh, like one person said, uh, you're wearing a dinner jacket, not a suit. I was like, okay. Right. Like that was an issue. That was right. like a negative against Well, me. exactly. The, you, you hadn't figured out how to dress properly for the occasion. I mean, I wouldn't even know the difference between a dinner jacket and a suit jacket, but that's the whole point, yes. right? Like yes. you should know the difference, apparently. Yeah. Uh, so, so when we talk about these elites, uh, I'm sure you also looked at the history of them, right? Uh, part of the reason why the elite is also maybe so disconnected from the masses is one of the first times an elite class was created was 1857 mm. when these masses were. Uh, revolting against Mm -hmm. uh, the the colonizers and then there were certain people who helped the British, Mm -hmm. who helped the colonizers and then they were rewarded of that and then they became financially elite Mm -hmm. in these areas. So essentially they were the enemies of the people who lived here. Right, right. Right. No, that that's exactly right. And some of them became wealthy through their support for the British, mm-hmm. and others were already existing, like Indian nobility, who were then paid off by the British and sort of were, were also colonized, just like the Indian masses were, but in a much more subtle way, so that they were used as agents mm-hmm. against their own people, right? With with these land and titles and these enormous perks, you know, and that was very purposeful on the part of the British to create this class who could administer British interests and shield the British from the Indian classes that they they didn't want to interact with. I mean, in 1947, if you owned hordes of land in Pakistan, how did you get it? Right, you got it from the British. Right. So you probably did something for the British, which is why they gave you all of this mm, land. Mm, yeah. So essentially when the country is created, we already have a landed class, which uh, 
is not thinking about the interests of the masses and almost see themselves as mini colonizers who've enslaved mm. people within their own areas. Right. Yeah, no, I think that's true. I mean, I think it's also worth noting that, you know, the, the nobility that already existed in India also had this, like, was subjugated by the British as well. Like, they lost their real political power. They did, they kept this, they kept this like, um, economic power, but they did lose any kind of real decision-making authority, which must have been, you know, an enormous blow. But again, what's, you know, in 1947, you know, the new state being developed, in addition to these colonised, you know, rulers, there were this, this whole new class that came in, you know, the trader class from Gujarat. Jinnah. Exactly, at Jinnah's request. And again, he was the, the, f- the first perfect example of how this elite network works. You know, he called on his community and, you know, said to these shopkeepers and traders, I need people to run the nation's industry. We have nothing. I think there was like one factory on the Pakistan side and the rest was on Indi- in India. So there was, the needs of the nation for industry was just enormous. And so he's like, you know, come... And I will give you concessions. I will give you interest-free loans. And, th- I mean, that's the most extreme example of these absolutely middle-class people being propelled into the upper echelons of power. And that many of those families are still the same families dominating business today. Not all of them, but many. I mean, uh, this is why I smoked a little when you said at Jinnah's request because it was pretty much a deal. Right. And they got a lot of out. They, it, it's not like they did it for Pakistan. They right. got a lot out of it. So if yeah. you're, a, you're a trader in Gujarat and suddenly you're being offered to be one of the top industrialists in Pakistan. So that switch from being a trader to an industrialist. Mm-hmm. And the, the, the leader of the nation is asking you to do that. Yeah. Exactly. And saying, here's a a a huge loan. It's a golden ticket, absolutely. Here's a huge loan and you don't have to pay it back for 10 years. And there won't be any, there won't be any interest on it. And, you know, anything that you need, we're going to support you with. So it's interesting because the country did need it. And so Jenna, I correctly identified, I have to lure people here now. We need this. But of course, the self-interest of the, of the people that came would be enormous. Of course, when you read the narratives that these families write about that, that period, it is infused with this nationalism, some of which may be real, some of it imagined. But, you know, like, I'm contributing to the birth of the nation. And they did, but they also built their own empires. Well, why did you take so much money from a new <laughs> nation that had nothing? Right. If you would cared so much about this country, right? why did you take a 10-year interest-free loan from the coffers of this country, which mm. was barely surviving? Mm. But they did, I mean, they had enormous risk, right? In, in developing a new industry, they had to be lured somehow. I mean, they were comfortable. They were comfortable in India and Gujarat. And Jinnah knew, like, this is a big change. I've got to make it worth their while. I mean, you've seen how the elite operate in Pakistan, right? Like, they, they, they're completely protected against the law. They're completely protected. I mean, it's, it's, you've created a West world for these people. Right. Uh, right. If you've to- spoken to somebody uh, from this community or some people from this community, do they also feel betrayed then? Because once they were lured in, they were for all the perks of the mm. world. Uh, I think subsequent governments did realize that maybe uh, mm. the, the benefits offered to them were a bit lopsided. Mm-hmm. And then these people do express animosity towards the state because they feel like they were robbed whereas yes. what really happened was the the inequality uh, that was being offered to them was reduced slightly and they mm-hmm. somehow see that as betrayal and 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 have continued feeling that animosity towards the state for it yes yes i mean 100 percent. there was this enormous sense of personal betrayal among most many many elites but i mean obviously the ones who actually lost their wealth felt it most keenly because you know, there were some of those trader families who developed enormous wealth in the first few decades and then with the war with east and west pakistan a number of them lost you know almost all of their wealth some of those families just disappeared from the top level of the elite at that point and of course they they're incredibly bitter but even those who who've managed to rebuild have gone through these cycles of you know enormous perks and then extreme punishment and it's it's incredibly cyclical you know like industry being nationalized in the 70s you know like things that they felt you know were theirs that they had worked for uh, to develop you know i rebuilt i built a nation that's how many of these people feel i built a nation there was no industry here I developed it, right? And then a government comes in and, take the, and takes it away from them and nationalizes it. It's enormous um, resentment, enormous resentment. 
Do they go would go back even uh, before that because when Ayub came in mm. he was the first dictator mm-hmm. uh he moved some or at least a lot of the power from Karachi to Punjab and yes. then Mehboob Haq the 22 families that he talks about mm. a lot of them are actually from Punjab That's right. not from Karachi That's right Yeah So so what was the question there <laughs> So then so do do they have any animosity towards Ayub also for that Oh yeah absolutely absolutely yeah I mean it, the, it, I think there's animosity most of the way around each of all of the families that I spoke with had been victimized in their view by various regimes by multiple regimes not every regime right obviously some families came out on top with different regime shifts but yeah many people were very unhappy with Ayub very and does it just boil down to ethnicity do they do they mention that the fact that these punjabis took it from us is that is that Yes, I mean it, it comes into it. It does come into it. Um I think that the ethnic divisions between the elite are you know really substantial and significant. Um and and you can see it with you know the shifts of power from from Karachi, you know, where there was this like political hub and then it moving to Punjab and then eventually moving up to Islamabad as well, you know, this trying to and that was a you know purposeful move on the part of the government to try to take political power away from you know like the the Lahori business elite and before that the you know the Karachi elite um so the military mm. does this uh, deliberately almost mm Verbal. I mean this shifting of power yes. the oh yeah and it's I mean it's in the historical record it's yeah. it's written very clearly it was 100% purposeful there is like there are historical documents saying we need to wrest power from the over developed power of the business elite in Karachi and Lahore. I mean what's their interest to ensure that this the, the business elite stays subservient to them? Yes, and I mean c- com- compliant and mutually beneficial. I mean th- th- their interest is in ensuring that business funds are are being used in support of their interests and that um the political party in power is enabling them a significant freedom to operate without enormous restrictions and it's a constant like balancing act between you know i mean at that time so sort of earlier on between like the landed elite and the business elite and then the emerging power of of, of the military um it's it's like a, it's a jostling for power and a reconfiguring of alliances with each change in government and is it sometimes even more blatant than that 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 once they do wrestle or jostle power away from them then it's their own family members who are rewarded because when, a lot of times when you look at the documents it ends up being that the friends or people that they work with they they somehow become the new elite mm. so so it's 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 at times it's even more blatant that it's not done for a public policy strategy it's done simply to benefit people around you. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Maybe most of the time. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's easy. It's easy to provide um sort of altruistic rationales to cover up things. And I mean, it can be both as well, right? You can have a policy which you can make a compelling argument benefits the nation in each of these ways, and then in practice it still benefits all your friends and supporters. right the way that you implement it the way that you administer it it can it can divide power in a way which yeah which rewards the people who supported you and that's what each each government has done each regime has done i mean the reason i was asking you about ayub is a lot of times people think of ayub as this golden era in the history mm-hmm. of pakistan mm-hmm. and uh, the books mention it as a decade of development but nobody actually really talks about the fact that they were these they were these 22 families who got really really rich mm-hmm. and who got all the state benefits and that's what they profited off but the masses stayed poor right right exactly there was no attempt to redistribute wealth more broadly not at all uh i mean this might be outside of your domain but Maybe. in terms of talking to them uh, the elite uh if the military interventions and the military regimes were harmful in some ways to them i'm i'm sure the answer is power but why are they still so entrenched with each other in terms of the military and yeah. the elite we we talk about these dhas mm-hmm. talk about and even why a business elite so interlinked so, with the military so so closely entrenched is it mm. just power and ensuring you're close to power 
Well, yes, and I think it comes down to like keep your enemies closer. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, honestly, that's what it is. Um, like each of these families is working really hard to ensure that no matter what happens and anything could happen in Pakistan, <laughs> no matter what happens, they will be protected. And so you ha- you, the military is one of the most powerful, maybe the most powerful institution in the country. So, of course, even if, if you're not happy with the way that they're acting or you're not happy with military power, you, you still, if you want to be safe from losing income, from being penalised in business or or any kind of political repercussion, you have to keep them close. Absolutely. And that's why there's so much intermarriage. That's why mm. business families, their primary goal is to marry their children to the sons or daughters of generals. That's like the best kind of marriage you can secure. If any general is looking for a good rishta <laughs> for their beautiful daughter, <laughs> I'm still single. Uh, general Saab, please. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, it's it's so insulated that mm. the, a leopard broke out. Uh, there, there, there's videos everywhere in yeah. DHFAs too in Islamabad. There's yeah. a leopard that's attacking people. I didn't think it attacked anyone. Did it, it did, of course. Really? What do you think the leopard was doing on the street? Well, I thought that I heard that they got it before it attacked anyone. No, no. Okay, there's okay. A somebody also tweeted that he almost died because the leopard went for his neck and then he moved in an angular way so the leopard attacked the back wow. and he has oh, the leopard attacked <laughs> okay. people okay. and then people were like DHA phase 2 is a lot far like it's further away from Margala Hills than a leopard should have made it and turns out it was at somebody's house uh-huh. and somebody had kept that leopard and the news is don't quote me on this because this isn't confirmed mm. uh, it was a general's house Right, of course, yeah. <laughs> and then in the FIR, the even though everybody knows the name as well, mm. nobody can talk about the name. Yes. So somebody's kept a leopard at their home, obviously illegally, you can't do mm-hmm. that. And then that leopard's broken out and endangered the lives of people and we can't even name it. Yes, yes, I'm not surprised. I'm not surprised at all. A number of, I never saw any leopards when I was doing my research. Did you see lions? No, I didn't see lions, but I did see a lot of people's homes where they had a lot of exotic animals. Like the harm, you know, like the more gentle kind. <laughs> Somebody kept a giraffe in in Karachi. Yeah, yeah. You've seen that? I've seen a giraffe. <laughs> <laughs> like however big your home is. Yeah, yeah. It's but, not big enough for a giraffe. Well, some of the homes that I were in had like quite large properties. For a giraffe? Well... <laughs> I mean, you wouldn't want to put it in an, ap- in an apartment, right? <laughs> I mean, however large your home oh. is, I mean, if it's, 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 it's a big animal oh, yeah. and then the, the lands that it usually grazes in Africa are... Well, I think that... You, you'll look- never replicate that. No, I don't think they're trying to replicate. Like, they're not trying to make a perfect environment for the giraffe. <laughs> Why keep a giraffe? Like a status symbol. Yeah. And then you, yeah. then these people hire a person to clean the shit of the giraffe. Like, whose only job... <laughs> because apparently giraffes sh- shit a lot. <laughs> so, Could well be. So it's just to show people that so I'm so rich that I can have a giraffe. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. What are some of the other exotic animals that you saw that you found strange? Oh, I mean, I mean, they weren't like particularly strange. There were things like ostriches. They were like that's pretty common. Yeah, there were quite a lot of ostriches. Oh my God. Like, there were some monkeys. Quite a lot of monkeys. Yeah, they're not as exotic as like and lots of people keep lions, lions as well. Actually, yeah, I, I never saw a lion. I did hear about lions, but I never saw one. What's some of the most disgusting exuberance of wealth that you saw? Uh, <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I don't, I didn't really go into it sort of finding things disgusting. You know, like you kind of have to get in a different headspace when you're doing this kind of research. And one of the things that you have to do is like remove as much judgment as possible because people know when you're judging them. Right. And people know if you dislike them. And so I remember like sort of starting this research and a friend asked me like, how can you spend time? Because I was spending many hours all day, all day. I mean, these people were 
my, my friends, right? We, we were spending time together all the time. I mean, how can you spend your time enjoying the best food in Pakistan, <laughs> sitting in the biggest cars, or how couldn't you do this? Like, it's, well, exactly. it's, it's a hard job, but exactly. somebody has to do it. Exactly. How did you spend your entire day at Polo Club <laughs> being wined and dined well, exactly. by the richest people in Pakistan? It was, it was really tough. It was right, and I had a friend who's like, how can you bear it? How can you just <laughs> hang out? And you know that they're doing all these things, and you know they're exploiting people, and you know there's all this corruption. Like well, you have to you have to understand where people are coming from, and and if you're judging them, you you can't understand where they're coming from. You can't understand what th- their perspective is, and and that doesn't justify. You still have to step back out of it again and put your judgment on. Saying, like, you on the other side, you've got to come back and like r- put your judgment back on. And of course, I do. You know, and then like you analyze what you're seeing and the effect of it and how it it creates this this society where it's impossible for people to, you know to benefit from economic growth or, you know, to participate in it or to, to really participate in the political life of the nation in a meaningful way. But that's what I'm saying. Once you go back and you're detached, you have to look at it uh, to, in a way. In a critical where, way. Yeah, uh, Like, for instance, I, in, in Sins, I was just driving through and, uh, and you're driving on the road and then you see these women who are walking miles to get water and then you enter a private enclave and they have a sprinkler system mm. where mm. they're watering the grass. Yeah. I mean, th- at some point you have to like feel, uh, maybe I'm Pakistani, so I feel it a lot more, but you have to feel this. Outrage. Yes. 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 That, I mean, yes. like Catwoman said, how can you live so large for so long and leave so little without realizing that there's a mm. storm coming, Mr. Wayne? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you felt that sometimes. No, I did. I did. Um, yeah, I mean, I think I think even things like the price-setting incidents that I talked about, you know, like on the back of that, there was this discussion of like driving through like rural Sindh and all these all these workers um, in these incredibly difficult conditions and this, this businessman was just talking about driving through and kind of gloating about how, you know, he'd price set, I think in one instance, they'd price set um, milk, you know, because people buy it as a daily, as a mm. daily commodity. And the other was, was cigarettes, you know, people buying cigarettes one by one. And, uh, and sort of gloating about how, you know, we've managed to bring the price up just to the point where a very, very poor worker will still buy it. You know, because if it goes too above, they'll stop buying milk. You know, or like uh, sugar. Sugar, of course, is a big That's one. The biggest mafia. Exactly. So sugar is right. one of the biggest things, and you know, like and, and poor people also consume high amounts of sugar. That's like well, their major source of calories, right? So it's huge amounts of sugar because it's cheaper than than other forms of other forms of calories, and. I just I did find myself feeling disgusted at one point with someone talking about raising the price right to the point where people will continue to pay, but no further. And just being so proud of that economic assessment i understand that's how the market works but it was kind of revolting when you're talking about the lowest the lowest um economic strata that struggles and that all they can buy is is on a daily basis if they if they don't work that day they don't they don't buy any sugar that day they don't they don't get a cigarette they don't get whatever it is that makes their life bearable and i thought that was that made me feel pretty uncomfortable so they do see themselves as being different from Pakistanis. They yes. do somehow describe themselves as just being different, like almost genetically different from the masses of Pakistan. Well, I mean, again, there's a lot of variation. So like, we've got to be careful not to say like the elites are all like this, right? Because there is a lot eat of variation. the rich. <laughs> They're all rich. That's true. <laughs> I mean, don't eat them. You'll get food poisoning. <laughs> They're toxic. <laughs> um, but I mean, I, I think people in, in different ways describe themselves as being different from the rest of Pakistan. I mean, they still view themselves as Pakistanis, of course, and they were proud of being Pakistani. But, I mean, everyone viewed it in a slightly different way. Some of the established elite, and this is another part that I found a bit revolting, was um, <laughs> was the paternalism that some people in the established elite have as elites, and they, they would talk with disgust about new money elites and about the garish ways they live their lives and ostentatious spending and their flashy cars and their their Punjabi accents or whatever it was, you know, really disdainful. And they would say, you know, they aren't elite. Elites have been given a God-given gift or right to to guide the nation. And these people are not guiding the nation. 
they're awful, you know, like they're only out for themselves. We elites are guiding the nation and that's why I don't include those other new rich in the elite. And that really got to me too, this sense of we're guiding the nation as though God has chosen us. Like you inherited your wealth, this isn't. That bothered me, right? And, and using the religious justification as though we are the chosen people rather than look at what you inherited. Look what schools you went to as a five-year-old. Look what look at the network that you had from, from the age of one years old. You I know? mean, it's, it's colonialism at play, right? It's, it's all the same colonial talking yeah, point. So it right. makes sense that people who got rich of colonization thinks of themselves as the new colonial masters mm. of this country who mm. are being... Right. entrusted by God as guiding these mm-hmm. savages. And and that's the perception, unfortunately, that seeped into the minds of uh, the rich in Pakistan, that most of Pakistanis are savages. And we somehow need to almost save Pakistan from Pakistanis. Right. And, and that, yes, that exactly, saving Pakistan from Pakistanis, that really bothered me. And again, that, and even within the elite, the, the, di- the distaste and aversion of the established elite towards the new money elite, I found extremely problematic. Because in... In practice, what they were doing and how they were disadvantaging the rest of the country was enormously similar. It's just that one group was maybe doing it slightly more obviously and they weren't conforming to the social rules the established elite like. They weren't they were acting in a way which was too obvious, too loud, too pretentious, rather than dressing it up really nicely. Right? I think that's also some of the problems that people have with the political class. Mm. Like politicians are looked down upon because at certain times they're, they're, they're from villages and they look a certain way with mm. their moustaches and mm-hmm. that's also frowned upon by uh, people who dress up in suits and think of themselves as right. Britishers. Yes, exactly. There was, um, I had some, one of my close, um, the close families that I work, um, spent time with were from KP and they, they also lived in, in Lahore and they would, like, one of their running jokes was to wear their full shower kameez and waistcoat and patan hats and go to like the top eating establishments in Lahore and just to proudly walk in and kind of observe the reactions of everyone around them. And I went with them a number of times while they were doing this. And it was just amazing. Like the whole restaurant would turn around and stare at them in horror. They were clearly wealthy. I mean, they turned up in a very expensive car. They're wearing Rolexes. They're, they're definitely wealthy. But they, again, maybe this is this. And they're being frowned upon by people wearing s- m- with much less money than exactly, them. Exactly. With much less money than them, but wearing, you know, Western suits and, and, and acting in a different way. And again, there's, it's, it's partly the ethnic divide and looking down on, on like, Pakhtun families, and um, but also like finding it not to be the right kind of elite display to be so so regional in your identity and so proud of that. You know, I, I thought that was really interesting. I mean, one of the waiters, I remember, came up and said, "Oh, I really like your outfit." Ha 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 ha! <laughs> you know, like I mean, it was that. It was that much of a scene. Waiter ne bilayli. <laughs> uh, anytime we talk about the elites and I, they're uh, the particular bane of my existence and I talk about them a lot and we talk about elite capture. Mm. I mean, the stats back it up, right? The UNDP report says that the elites enjoyed somewhere close to $18 billion in subsidies from the government of Pakistan. Uh, the retort from a lot of people who've been tricked into this elite propaganda into thinking that uh, this is how just how the world works is... Every every country in the world has elites. So it's not like the Pakistani elites in particular have a problem. Mm. But would you say that the Pakistani elite in particular are different from the elite of the world as well? Well, I think in so many ways they are very, very similar in the way that they acquire their wealth and guard against it through all these practices that we've been talking about. It's remarkably similar. But I think there are a couple of things which are different about the Pakistani elite. And one of them mm-hmm. is like the level of integration between families holding different spheres of power is much higher than in other places. So like this this interlinking of political, military and business power. You don't see it to such a high degree in other places. It still exists, but here it is the norm. It is almost every family has this you know this this interlinking um, process, and that is again that's a protective mechanism because this because the political system is so unstable. But again, there are some similarities in other places. So um, there's an interesting 
study that was undertaken in Bangladesh with industrial factory owners. And one of the quotes of, of a factory owner there was, um, yeah, the instability or, or the, the challenges of operating in Bangladesh are our greatest strength because it means that foreign, organiz- foreign mm. companies can't come in and take all the benefits. We get to keep the benefits for ourselves because they wouldn't be able to navigate this complex space. And, and I think Pakistan has that even more so, right? It, it, it's even even more obvious. I think it's um, that's the, the fact that they're so unproductive uh, is, is another, the, mm. the unique factor, the fact that like they're producing sugar, they're producing milk, they're producing things which might be useful for a Pakistani industry. Mm. But they're not really thinking about exports. They're not really mm. thinking about competing on a global scale. They're right. very happy being insulated from the rest of the world and enjoying the perks and privileges mm. staying in this country as opposed to actually doing something which will make them globally competitive or help Pakistan. Mm. Yeah, no, I think that's right. And, th- and that's something that I've spent quite a lot of time sort of trying to get my head around and, and basically concluded that given given the instability here and their ability to thrive in it, it makes sense to keep all of their efforts within Pakistan rather than to attempt to diversify. So like one of the one of the families um, I talk about um, at the end of the book, he, he, he he's trying to, to bring actually there's a number of people, you know like sometimes they call themselves indentors, mm-hmm. trying to bring foreign investment to Pakistan and their role is helping these foreign firms to navigate the political and economic space here. But again, it's not about them taking out Pakistani industry to the rest of the world or Pakistani products. They're just helping to channel additional funds into Pakistan and particularly to themselves and to their families. But it, again, it's inward looking. So when you do engage with the outside world, it's about bringing it back in rather than bringing a Pakistani product out. Although there are, there are exceptions to that in Karachi as well. Uh, there are a number of business people who did operate regionally and globally uh, in a more professional manner, um, which is just worth mentioning. But I, I don't think it's the majority so you have to run in 10 minutes so we'll just uh, succession planning in Pakistan in elite business families why does it fail so miserably when compared with family businesses in other countries uh, well I mean I guess it depends on what you mean by succession planning like meaning that the the wealth dissipates down the line of the family or that they take over family businesses I mean I did meet a lot of families who would talk about um, the third generation destroying the wealth created by the first generation and it did seem to be that a lot of third generation families didn't have either the skill or the interest in maintaining their current business um, but perhaps the, I mean, the succession planning would perhaps be more successful if it was outside the family right mm-hmm. if they were if they were making it more professional and and removing the family from key decision making roles on the board that would probably be more successful <laughs> uh, what are the differences between the urban and the rural elite well again it depends on what we mean by the rural and urban elite mm. these days most uh, of well many of the urban elite that i researched also had land holdings and connections in rural locations so i think the divide between the urban and rural elite is much less significant than it used to be. If you were talking about like new business people and a feudal class, that would be a very significant difference. But increasingly, there are like rural connections in urban places and and vice versa. So the differences are not as severe. I get if you look at feudal classes, that's a whole other story. That operates in a very different way and that comes back to this British inherited power that we talked about earlier. Our social structures do not allow equal opportunities for wealth creation. The British also exploited those structure, structures to their advantage. What is one big thing we can do to alter that? <laughs> uh, How do we fix ourselves, Rosie? Yes. How do we do it? Just tell us. I don't think it's right to ask a foreign lady to explain White how savior. to fix Pakistan. White savior, please. <laughs> exactly. Simon, I'm, I'm Simon gonna, come back. <laughs> I'm going to bow out from the white savior role. <laughs> 
<laughs> you know, I mean, <laughs> wow, you really missed out by creating wealth for yourself by writing a book. You could have just become a vlogger. <laughs> well, I mean, you know that I make zero wealth from this book. Zero. I'm saying you could you could have made so much money. I mean, you had oh. access to all these elite places. Just take a camera, make your vlogs. Vlogs. <laughs> like, I could probably have got into some kind of business if I I could have used my connections to start some kind of profitable business. So many business. white vloggers made so much money off Pakistan. Oh, I mean, shame I didn't know this. Oh, t- t- this guy came on TV and uh, this horse rider asked him for three thousand rupees, mm. which would be what like ten dollars, like eleven dollars, mm-hmm. right? For for a few rides on the horse, and then he posted this video like got scammed on CVU by this horse rider because obviously if it was a Pakistani who would have charged much uh-huh. less. Yeah, sure. Uh, and he that that video has like millions of views. So probably the the vlogger did he make any money from that video though? Did he get his ten dollars back? Oh, I mean the vlogger made like millions. I'm assuming. I don't know. <laughs> I mean the the video has like five million views. So the just the YouTube revenue from that. Yeah, but the YouTube revenue probably be, didn't go to him. For the vlogger. Yeah. Who else would it go to? Oh, I have no idea. Who knows? Maybe I should have. <laughs> You're just standing up for your community. <laughs> Not at <laughs> all. Just, just white people looking out after each other. What's new? <laughs> oh, oh wow! Low blow. <laughs> Easy shot and too low. <laughs> PayPal and digital solutions are not allowed in Pakistan. What about the good and bad effects of PayPal and digitization of Konya? I think that's a very complicated I'm question. Not a, but I'm not uh, what I I, I I will uh, the way I will phrase this question is you know these these avenues mm-hmm. where people can make money. I also feel like. The elite create deliberate hindrances in that to ensure mm. that through apps or through new, new avenues, mm. the people that upward mobility in society does not exist. Like the yeah. elite also make sure that the rural classes and the middle classes stay in their places. Right. Well, because those technolo- technologies can be doc- democratizing yes. tools, right? For, and and they and they they level the playing field for engaging in business. So I I totally agree. Blocking them is something that some elites do to prevent that from happening. Is Pakistan elite aware of their incompetence? Is this incompetence by construction or a choice or due to pure incompetence? I think it is prior that it is true since they're not interested in working for the majority and live in their elite silos. Well, again, what do we mean by incompetence? Do we mean? I mean, actually, they're very successful by their own by their own standards. Their their objective is to make wealth for themselves mm. and to hold on to power for themselves, and they do that very successfully. So, highly competent. <laughs> Highly competent. Uh, Asif Ali Ghazi has an interesting comment. He says, "Interestingly, she contains army in her name." <laughs> <laughs> I see why you were interested in the elite. <laughs> Pakistan. <laughs> That's also another complicated question. How power prevails and operates and exploits the oppressed in our society, and where does it stem from, and how to deconstruct? Where Where do you think mm. these elites well, are driving their power from? Well, I mean, there is something about the way. This is a big answer, but there's something about the way that Pakistan was founded, and you know, Hamza Alavi has mm. a really interesting foundational theory on this and the overdeveloped military bureaucracy. And basically, that I'll just say it quickly. That theory is that because of um, colonized history, post-colonial nations have these overdeveloped political um, bureaucratic military states because they need to control and coerce the masses. And mm. when the state becomes independent, those patterns are still in place and creates a path dependency. I think that's a really useful way of understanding where elites have ended up today. It builds on that colonial legacy of coercion and privilege. And it's hard to, it's hard to break away from that model once it's been entrenched. There's also a really good article in Dawn a couple of years back about your book and uh, Hamza Lavi's uh, thesis uh, mm-hmm. using both of them i link that article oh yeah uh, how do monopolistic capitalism class structure and authoritarianism interact at the micro level in the pakistani social and state structures that's the hypothesis of her book that's, <laughs> that's pretty much the entire exactly. book exactly <laughs> so you can read the book and we'll talk all about it <laughs> <laughs> but do you do you have a comment <laughs> no i mean just that's pretty i much think the that's book, a, right? yeah exactly yeah, yeah, that is yeah. the book <laughs> 
is there, is there a relationship between religion and capitalism in pakistan and perpetuating inequality if and if so how do religion and capitalism facilitate the existing class system and economic inequality mm, i i don't know i wouldn't say that religion facilitates it but i would say that religion is used to justify an existing class structure and it is subverted to make inequality appear natural like this is the way that god willed it and people utilize that argument to say this is how it should be um this is the natural order of things there are a lot of people who are asking for like answers how do we make I the know. elite more productive how do we ensure that there is more economic equality but i guess this the none of this mm. falls under the ambit of your research right mm, mm, uh, i think that's that's maybe when you read the book you can develop some of those answers mm. that would be that would be helpful to see how is the relationship between elite capture and economic growth different in pakistan and india did you compare the pakistani elite with the indian elite at all to some extent but of course i didn't do original research mm. in india so i can't compare it um in the same way i mean there's a lot of similar origins but of course india's trajectory has been very different um and i think looking into those differences is like a long and substantial argument mm. <laughs> that we don't have time to get into now uh can she talk about her own positionality as a foreign white woman while doing this ethnography we did start with that if she can talk a bit more about the methodology any ethical concerns with living at a key informant's place how did she ensure uh, her work was not extractive and how does she view giving back mm yeah interesting um well it's easy to not be extracted when you're the less powerful member of the relationship so you know traditionally anthropologists have more power than the people that they s- study and i had less and um, critically just being transparent about my objectives um you know with that family that i was close to i you know i i included specific stories that emerged out of their lives and it, and i i ran many of them by them afterwards and just said are you okay with me including this story and they said yeah 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 publish whatever you want oh, we don't care it's it's completely fine so i think as long as you're honest about what you're doing that's really the primary thing and uh, you did have some power i guess maybe i mean the, the discussion that we had at the beginning of the podcast in terms of uh there is a power associated in pakistan at being a foreigner mm. uh, yeah i mean sure but that's it's kind of more an association like when you're middle class younger female you're dealing with extremely wealthy politically powerful older men it's hard to say that it would be hard to say that i had as much power as them i i can't actually say how you could justify it not as much as them but we, uh, more more than probably a pakistani researcher sure yeah, 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 yeah. of course yeah exactly as long as one is conscious of that and mentions that, i mean if you're reading the book you obviously know who she is and where yeah. she's from and what she's doing so yeah. you're already uh viewing everything in that light and i think it's fair to yeah. do so and it's important and i think it's so important i do think it's a very important question i have a whole chapter mm-hmm. about my positionality as a foreign white middle class british origin like woman mm. right and how that affected my research and how that gave me opportunities that wouldn't be available to a regular pakistani um but also you know sh- yeah changed how my respondents interacted with me and, and the kind of opportunities i was able to participate in for more read <laughs> <laughs> big capital in an in an unusual world <laughs> the, uh ma- micro politics of wealth the in pakistan micro politics of wealth in pakistan uh get the book now uh, read it thank from you so liberty much from books i was they haven't paid me for that <laughs> get it from anywhere get it from anywhere you if want if you can but probably liberty books get it from anywhere you want <laughs> uh we have to end this because she's going to an institution that is not as good as lums but <laughs> 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 but it's okay. No, <laughs> did you go to Lums? Were you in Lahore? No, unfortunately I couldn't go to Lums this time um because the schedule was mixed up. I was planning to. Okay. Well, thank you so much uh, for you. coming on and yeah. uh, I'll see you at KLF. Great. See you there. Uh, all right. Take care everybody. <laughs> thank you for listening. Bye-bye.